uh, even though she finished the PhD only a few years ago, she's already a highly cited author because uh, she managed to treat a topic that I think is becoming more and more important, climate change adaptation, and also how people uh, relate to that, right? The more we accelerate the transition, the more these behavioral aspects are becoming really, really important. Uh, and then it was also a great occasion for us to invite Alessia, one of the new researchers at the FSR since a few months, who joined our climate team. Uh, and the climate team has been very successful in European research projects. And one of these projects is Capable that started in January. And also they will touch on this topic, um, which they frame as policy acceptability um, and developing economic frameworks for that. So how desirable can climate strategies be and how to present them? Um, so Anna will first give a presentation. Alessia has prepared a few questions, but of course, as always, we expect you also to be active. So don't hesitate to put your comments in the chat box, your questions in this Q&A box. I'll pick them up um, as we go. Uh, and yeah, let's go, Anna. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Leonardo. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anna van Valkgoed. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Groningen. And today I have the great pleasure of uh, presenting here my research on the psychology of climate change adaptation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen. So as you can see, my talk today is indeed going to be on climate change adaptation. And we're going to specifically be talking about the psychological aspects of it. So I'm an environmental psychologist, which is the scientific discipline that studies the interaction between people and the environment. And I specifically am located at the University of Groningen, and we are one of the uh, few universities in the Netherlands that has an environmental psychology group. Uh, and also internationally, our group is uh, very well renowned for uh, conducting research on people and environment interactions. And at our group, we specifically have a focus on climate change. So I have very many colleagues who are working more on the psychology also of mitigating climate change. Uh, we have many people, for example, are researching um, energy, the energy transition and also the acceptability of energy, um, energy policies. Um, and of course, and myself, I'm working more on adaptation at the moment, uh, which is a growing theme also within our group. Uh, and there are also other topics that we are tackling um, and that we are kind of shifting our attention to. So one of these themes, for example, is more also the, um, uh, the psychological impacts of climate change. So for example, the topic of climate anxiety is one of the research, recent themes that we have also started working on and conducting research on. So as psychologists, our focus is really on individuals, households, and groups. So first, I wanted to take a little bit of time to explain to you why should we even focus on individuals and households when we are talking about climate change adaptation. If you look at climate change policies or adaptation policies at the moment, it is my impression that individuals and households are really overlooked. So for example, here you have a picture uh, that is uh, taken from the Dutch National Climate Adaptation Program. Uh, and you see here that they have identified the key relevant actors for adaptation in the Netherlands. And you can clearly see that they uh, identify industry, NGOs, science and government as relevant actors, but individuals and households are not mentioned here. And there's also scientific evidence to back, it up, to back this up. So here is a paper that reviewed uh, different uh, adaptation initiatives across 402 cities worldwide. And they found that um, uh, the private sector and citizens were actually not mentioned that often. And especially citizen participation was very, very relatively rare in these kinds of adaptation initiatives. But why should we focus on, on, in, on individuals and households anyway to begin with? I think there are three main reasons why looking and considering the role of individuals is important. First, governments will become overstrained in their capacities to cope with climate change risks. So protection against climate change risks can no longer always be guaranteed from governments to their uh, citizens. 
And at the same time, behaviors at the micro level, so performed by individuals on households, are actually really effective in reducing climate change risks. Of course, to some extent, there also need to be uh, infrastructural or governmental level policies, but uh, there are things that individuals and households can do uh, that can make a difference in becoming more climate adaptive. And also the adaptation actions that individuals and households take can also influence the effectiveness of governmental strategies. And to illustrate this last point, I want to show you some quotes from this article uh, from 2016, where they research how um, citizen actions actually influence governmental adaptation strategies during a flood in a, in a city in Germany. So here you see a quote uh, from this article saying that um, uh, uh, policymakers explaining how there was a lot of damage that could have been avoided during this disaster because uh, individual residents ignored warnings and evacuation instructions. Um, so he's actually saying here that a lot of damage could have been avoided if people actually had taken warnings seriously, if they had used their time to move valuables and drive vehicles away, um, and also that the failure of individuals and households to adapt also put additional pressure on the government because they needed to perform costly and dangerous rescues by boat and helicopters. This is another quote from the same article. Here, um, again, the, the policymaker is giving examples of how the failure of individuals and households to adapt can actually hamper the uh, governmental response. Uh, because and, and the example they give here is that if people are not well prepared during a disaster, they might call for help excessively. So there were people in this municipality who during the flood would call the municipality uh, 700 times because their cellar was flooded and they were blocking the emergency lines by doing so. And lastly, this is another example from a different flooding event where there were residents who wanted to uh, pump away flood water that had flooded into their cellars, but they they pumped the water straight into the sewage system, over uh, uh, overburdening it and then forcing the contaminated water to uh, come out into the streets in other areas. Um, so this is another example of how the behavior that individuals and households uh, undertake during uh, a disaster can actually really affect the adaptation strategy as a whole that governments might have in place. Um, and this can be either because uh, individuals and households fail to act, or it could be because they do act, but they act in such a way that they unintentionally um, actually cause problems elsewhere, like in this flooding example. So what does adaptation at the uh, individual and household level actually look like? Um, for one of our first explorations into this topic, we came up with this overview of how individuals and households can actually adapt. And you see there are a few different categories of behavior. Um, in, most important is, of course, information seeking. We want people to be aware of the kinds of risks they're exposed to, but also that they know what to do in case a disaster strikes. Uh, then there are preparation measures that people can take before the onset of a disaster to make sure that they are actually prepared. Uh, it should it should a uh, climate related risk occur, such things can be, for example, having an emergency kit, uh, making sure the home is well maintained, uh, storing important documents uh, in safe places. Um, and there's also protection actions people actually need to take during the, uh, the onset of uh, um, a climate related risk. So examples of this include, for example, taking measures to stay cool during a heat wave. And then on the right hand side, we have some other um, types of behaviors that maybe are a bit less common or you might not immediately think of, such, for, such as, for example, making sure you have the right insurance that protects you from uh, the economic damages of climate related risks. Also political actions, so making sure that people collectively strive for um, adaptation policies and also support adaptation policies when they are implemented in their, in their local municipality, for example. And also evacuation and migration is a a huge strategy uh, that's very important in reducing um, harm and damages from um, climate related hazards. And uh, as, as the previous quote also showed, failing to evacuate when this is necessary uh, can really be a huge burden also for um, collective or governmental adaptation strategies.
So a key question is, of course, what motivates individuals and households to adapt? And this is really the part where the psychologists come in, because ultimately what motivates behavior is, of course, very often a psychological question. So this is also where we feel like as, as uh, environmental psychologists, we could make a, a key contribution to this literature on adaptation because um, there were studies before already on kind of the psychological motives behind um, what motivates people to be prepared, say, for disasters more generally, but there wasn't really a dedicated literature quite yet to what specifically motivates people to adapt to climate-related risks, and also with the idea that climate-related risks will become more severe and more uh, will occur more frequently as well in the future. So when we look into this more general literature about what motivates people to prepare for disasters, we find that there are two main key assumptions um, that people uh, often write about uh, when they try to explain people's behavior. So the first assumption is that people uh, are motivated to act when they perceive that there's a risk for them. Uh, and risk is often operationalized here as the perceived probability of an event occurring as well as the perceived severity of an event. So the assumption here is that if people think the risk is, uh, say, a flood happening in your town, that this is likely to happen and that it will have severe consequences, that this will motivate people to act and make sure that they take measures uh, to protect themselves from this specific risk. And another assumption is, is also that experience is key in motivating adaptive behavior. So if, say, for example, you experience a severe flood, like in this photo, then the next time you will be motivated to change uh, your behavior and make sure that you have adaptation measures because you don't want this same thing to happen again or the same damages to happen again to you. So experience should also be a key motivating factor there. And these were kind of the main drivers or assumed to be the main drivers of people's behavior to prepare for disasters more generally, but also adaptation behaviors more specifically. So we wanted to know if indeed these assumptions were, were correct and if also there were maybe other psychological motives that we should also be considering uh, because as psychologists we know for example from the literature on pro-environmental behavior that there can actually be many different motivational factors that come into play. So we really were curious to see if there was more out there than just risk perception and experience as the main drivers of these adaptation behaviors. But if there um, are also other psychological motives that we needed to consider. So what we did is we conducted a meta-analysis of the factors motivating climate change adaptation behavior. And a meta-analysis is a study where you conduct an overview of previously published uh, empirical studies. And you kind of collect all of the findings from the literature that's out there, and then you synthesize them into one overview uh, so that you can also compare and contrast results across different studies. So let's first have a look at what uh, the literature tells us about the role of experience and risk perception in people's adaptation behavior. And here you see a picture kind of summarizing the results across all of those different studies. So the red line is basically the, the, the no effect. So this implies that the perceived risk or the level of risk that people perceive does not relate to people's adaptation behaviors. Any, uh, anything under the red line indicates studies that show a negative effect. So the more people perceive a risk, the less likely they are to adapt and everything above the red line indicates a positive effect. So meaning that the more people experience risk, the more likely they are to adapt. So you can see here that most of these studies are indeed above the red line, indicating that most studies indicate that there's at least some positive correlation between the perceived risks and people's adaptation behaviors. So this assumption seems to be supported to at least some extent. You do see that most of the big studies, so the, the bigger the circle, it indicates that the study had more participants, so it's usually more reliable. Uh, the bigger studies are usually kind of closer to the zero line, indicating that these uh, uh, have a smaller overall effect and there were some studies that showed stronger effects but overall there was um, 
kind of a moderate effect uh, shown across studies for the relationship between risk perception and adaptation behavior. So generally, this, this does seem to confirm that the more people perceive a risk and the more so the more they think their a risk is severe and has a, a higher likelihood of occurring, the more likely they are to implement adaptation behaviors. And if we look over for experience, you can interpret these findings in the same way. Here we do see overall there's actually a smaller effect of experience than risk perception on people's adaptation behavior. Uh, but overall, we see that people who have experienced uh, a climate related risk before are somewhat more likely to implement these adaptation behaviors. But this is definitely not the case for, for everyone. So just experiencing a risk is not um, an immediate uh, kind of motivator for people to implement these adaptation behaviors. And this in itself is an important finding because sometimes you will see kind of this argument where people say oh the the, the adaptation uh, behavior uh, problem will kind of solve itself because we can expect more climate related risks to happen so people will experience them, them more and if they experience it they will then you know be motivated to adapt the next for the next time uh, but this research shows that um, this it does have a small effect, but it's not a guaranteed or a given that if people experience a risk, they will be more prepared the next time around. Um, but another important finding that we um, found in this literature overview is actually that there were a lot more uh, psychological factors that we found that also played a role in these adaptation decisions beyond just the experience of a risk and also risk perception. Um, and I'm not uh, going to go through that complicated looking chart because I have this picture that um, summarizes it in a bit more of an accessible way. So if we look at the left hand side, of course, we have perceived risk, as I just explained, does play a role in um, whether people take adaptation decisions, but there are also these other factors and I want to highlight a few of them. So on the bottom of this picture, we see self efficacy and outcome efficacy, and these are perceptions that relate to people's uh, um, uh, feeling whether they are actually able to do something that's effective in protecting them against these climate change risks. So self-efficacy is all about can I do it? Can I take the measures that actually um, are necessary for me? Am I able to implement them? This is both psychological as well as practical. So do I have time? Do I have money? Do I have resources? Do I know what to do? And then there's also outcome efficacy, which we also found was important. And this is all about whether people think actions are going to be effective. So if I implement this action, will it actually protect me against climate change risks? So we found that actually these two efficacy perceptions were really important also in determining people's adaptation behaviors. And the more people think they are capable or perceive themselves as capable of implementing these actions, as well as the perceived effectiveness of those actions, were both associated with more adaptation behavior. So the key takeaway here is that it's not just the per perceiving the risk or being aware of the problem, it's also that people need this sense of efficacy that they know there are things I can do and those are going to help me and protect me uh, against these climate change risks. And also more on the right hand side, you also see that um, injunctive and descriptive norms were important. And this basically says something about the behavior of other people. So we found that people are more likely to adapt if they also think that other people expect them to do this. So if there's some norm in your local community or maybe in your family that adaptation is important and that is something um, that also other people do. Um, and that's also what this descriptive norm is referring to that uh, people are more likely to adapt if they see others around them doing the same thing. Um, and this was especially important factor in uh, studies about um, evacuation. So there, there are a few studies that show quite a big effect uh, that people only start to evacuate if they see their neighbors and other people in their uh, uh, neighborhood do the same thing. So also do not uh, underestimate the effect of kind of the social uh, power uh, here because people do really look towards what others in their direct environment are doing that can play a big role in their adaptation decisions as well. <laughs>
So to round off, uh, I want to say something a little bit also about the role of climate change perceptions, because that's, of course, also the title of the talk that I'm giving today, um, because we've already reviewed a few of these psychological factors that play a role in um, adaptation decisions, such as risk perception, self-efficacy, social norms. But one of the things that we were really interested in was also people's perceptions of climate change. So climate change perceptions are defined as a set of cognitions about what climate and climate change mean and what the essential attributes of climate are. So very briefly, this is often operationalized as the way people think about the reality causes and consequences of climate change. So do people think climate change is real or do they not think climate change is happening? Do people think climate change is man-made? Or do they think it's a natural phenomenon? And the consequences that I mentioned relates to whether people think climate change will uh, have consequences that are positive or negative, but also people's perceptions of where and when these consequences will take place. Because we know that sometimes people know that climate change is real and that it has um, human-made causes, but sometimes people perceive these, the consequences of climate change as, for example, occurring only in faraway locations. Um, so that's also something that we wanted to study uh, and see if these perceptions of climate change make a difference in people's adaptation behavior. And we specifically got onto this trail because we saw a few papers that kind of had the surprising conclusion that people's climate change perceptions didn't really predict their adaptation behaviors. For example, this paper already summarizes this in the title. It says, does it matter if you believe in climate change, not for coastal home vulnerability? So here they, they found that people's climate change perceptions, so whether they believe in the existence and human causes of climate change, did not actually predict whether they um, took measures to make their home more uh, protected against um, hurricanes, I think, specifically in this study. And there was also this study about agnostic adaptation, which basically talked about this idea that people will adapt to climate change anyway, because they, they respond to what's ongoing in their direct environment. So if there are more floods happening or there's more droughts happening, then people will start to act and respond to that anyway. And then it doesn't really matter that much if uh, people are aware or not if it, that those changes are due to climate change or even man-made climate change. Um, so they, they have this term here, agnostic adaptation, um, to refer to actions that address climate change effects without acknowledges, acknowledging its existence or human causes. And they are in this article suggesting um, that in communities where climate change is maybe a polarized topic, say for example, in the US, I think where this study was conducted, then you don't have to mention the climate if you want to talk about adaptation. You can just maybe talk more about these regional impacts or the local consequences without having to mention climate change itself. So we wanted to know if indeed these climate change perceptions um, kind of surprisingly would not predict people's adaptation behaviors. Um, uh, so we conducted a study of our, of our own on this topic to explore this idea further. And this is the paper that we published on it. What we did is we conducted a large scale survey in the Northern Netherlands. We had almost 3000 respondents. We asked people these questions about their climate change perceptions. So do you believe in climate change? What's causing it? What do the consequences look like? And then we also had a bunch of questions about uh, adaptation behaviors, also different kinds of behaviors, such as policy support, information seeking and adaptation behaviors. And we found actually that all of these kinds of climate perceptions were positively associated with policy support. So the more people perceive climate change as real human cause and having negative consequences, the more supportive they were of policies to implement, uh, of implementing policies to adapt to climate change in their local neighborhood. Also, we found that people who had stronger climate change perceptions were more likely to look up or even had already looked up information about uh, climate change risks in their local uh, area. So this, this also information seeking was predicted by people's climate change perceptions. And if we ask people about their intentions to implement uh, a variety of different adaptation measures, such as installing a green roof or uh, having the insulation in the house, we also see again that people's climate change perceptions do seem to predict 
people's intentions to, to do all of these things. So again, the more people think climate change is real, it's human caused and has negative consequences, the more likely they are to say, yes, I want to take or I intend to take these adaptation measures. Um, but the surprising thing was if we ask people, okay, have you already implemented these adaptation measures? Here we also see this similar kind of non uh result in the sense that we did not find significant correlations between climate change perceptions and most of these adaptation behaviors. So even though climate change perceptions were associated with people's intentions to implement it, we did not see a clear effect that people who had these stronger climate change perceptions also had implemented, so actually already implemented more of these adaptation behaviors. I know I'm already a little bit over the time, but I'm hoping I can just uh, take two more minutes to just finish up my story, if that's okay, Lena. Yeah, yeah, that's fully okay, Anna. Okay, great, because I have one more study that kind of adds nicely to the story so that I can wrap it up for you nicely, because now you are probably wondering how come these climate change perceptions, they predict these intentions, but not the behaviors, right? Because this is really also what we really wanted to know, because we do clearly see here in the study that climate change perceptions are associated with information seeking, at intentions, policy support. But how come it doesn't also show in the behaviors themselves? Why is that link um, seem to be there, there's why does there seem to be some disconnect to actually implementing the behaviors if people do have those stronger intentions? Uh, and so we followed up and we tried to disentangle this question in, uh, in another study that we, we did and uh, it fortunately got accepted for a publication in risk analysis, it's currently in print, so it should be out soon. And what we did here was we conducted a study in the south of the Netherlands and we did a longitudinal study this time around. So we had two time points at which we measured um, uh, all of our constructs of interest because we wanted to see if we could predict whether you know, these changes over time would actually occur in people's adaptation behaviors and also what is predicting those changes in behavior. So what we did is we asked again for people's adaptation behaviors and also their intentions to do so. And this time around, we asked for uh, a host of different psychological factors, uh, including climate change perceptions. And now we wanted to know, okay, what can explain this intention behavior gap? So what we did is we looked at the um, people's responses at time one and also at time two for their adaptation behaviors. And then we checked, okay, which behaviors have, have they implemented any adaptation behaviors in the one year time period? And then we wanted to know, okay, what separates the people who have taken these adaptation behaviors in that one year period from the people who didn't? And can we see kind of psychologically what's happening there and how is these people different? So again, in this study, we found that people's climate change perceptions predicted people's intentions, but not directly also their actual changes in behavior. But there were two psychological factors that did predict those changes in behavior over time. And they were, again, self-efficacy. So this sense that people have that they are able to implement the adaptation behaviors and also outcome efficacy. So that whether people believe that implementing the action will actually be effective in protecting them um, against these climate change risks. So it seems that overall, while these climate change perceptions, they do play a role in adaptation and they do uh, um, um, relate to people's intentions to implement adaptation actions as well as information seeking and policy support. They are alone not sufficient uh, in motivating this behavior change because again people also need to have this sense of efficacy uh, in the sense of that they know that they can implement the measures, they know how to do it and they have the resources to do it uh, as well as the they, they need to know which actions are effective uh, and that they can actually, um, and that they also perceive them as being effective um, in protecting them against climate change risks. So my takeaways from this talk are that individuals and households do play a key role in adaptation to climate change and they should not be forgotten in adaptation planning. Uh, we sh I showed you that there are different psychological determinants that can play a role in whether people decide to adapt or not. So there's more than just risk perception and experience, but there's a host of psychological factors that are important to consider here. 
And lastly, we studied the role of the climate change perception specifically, and we found that they do play a role in people's intentions uh, and also information seeking and policy support. But if we want people to also take that next step to actually implementing adaptation behaviors, here efficacy becomes really important. And we need uh, people need to know what to do and how to do it, and that they also know that it's effective. That's it for me. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Great, Anna. Very, very interesting work and also a very nice presentation. Okay, Alessia, you can kick off uh, the discussion. Uh, go ahead. Yes. So thanks, Anna. It's uh, really, really interesting. So um, I think that uh, um, so the first point, uh, so according to the first part of the, your presentation, I think that maybe the first point uh, to address should be uh, understand why individuals and also households are not considered in the implementation of, of climate change adoption policies, despite uh, you also show that it's it has been largely demonstrated the importance of these, uh, these actors uh, in such contexts. So uh, I, I perceive that uh, individuals in general are underestimated. So I, I mean, uh, uh, their role uh, in uh, the climate change adoption is uh, underestimated. And I also perceive from your presentation that uh, uh, governments think maybe that people don't have the adequate knowledge or tools uh, to act and changing uh, the, the situation, the, the, our situation. So I, I think that the policymaker must change uh, the way uh, to see individuals uh, and try to consider them not like uh, uh, minor actors, but uh, like a partner in, in this challenge. And so concern, concerning this comment, uh, uh, I was wondering, in your opinion, what is the, the main uh, barriers that leads policymakers do not pay much attention to uh, the individual's uh, adoption process? So why um, don't they give importance uh, to uh, individual's role? And second, and I think uh, this comment is quite uh, linked uh, with my first question. So I was thinking about uh, the different typologies of uh, adaptive behaviors that you show before. And uh, I think that uh, we agree that uh, uh, there are several actions very different uh, each other. For instance, uh, uh, political action is completely different uh, to for instance, implementing uh, to implement protection measure uh, against uh, natural disasters. And so uh, I was assuming that uh, the strategies that policymakers must uh, implement to promote the climate change adoption behavior should be different to each other. So I was wondering, so this huge differentiation, if there's of course, uh, makes uh, the policymakers work much more complicated, complicated or can they address uh, this issue applying a, a common or a general strategies? Yes, thank you, Alessia. Very interesting questions. So let me start with your question about why policymakers maybe pay less attention to individuals and households. Uh, I think this is very, very good and interesting question. I think in general within the climate change um, literature, there has been less interest or less less research is being conducted on the role of individuals and households. So for example, uh, in in I think it was only in the most recent IPCC report that also psychologists and behavior change experts were also involved as uh, uh, to give their their professional expertise on, for example, behavior change in the context of climate change. Uh, so already from a scientific uh, from the scientific literature, we already think I think we see this focus maybe on more policy measures or maybe inf infrastructural changes or maybe even more technological. Uh, uh, solutions to climate change rather than a focus maybe more on behavior uh, and um, 
uh, what we also call the more the demand side solutions. And you see this both in mitigation behavior, I would say, as well as adaptation behavior. For example, if you look at the climate models that are currently used to uh, plot different trajectories, a relatively new development in this literature is that they will also try to model be people's behavior change. So before this time, all of these climate models were really focused on uh, 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 more of the technological solutions and more the policy changes. And now they, they are considering also modeling more these lifestyle changes and finding out suddenly, oh, okay, these lifestyle changes can actually also have a big influence on these models. And therefore they should be part of the solutions that we are considering also um, to the climate crisis, which is, which is interesting because I think maybe for many people, the role of individual people is clear, especially if we talk about uh, uh, mitigation behaviors, uh, a lot of the time it will be about, okay, what can you do for the environment and how, what behaviors are you changing? So it might seem like there's a bit of a disconnect there that in the public discourse on climate change, there's a lot of focus, it seems to be on the individual and how people can change the behavior, whereas in science and maybe policy, the focus is uh, more on kind of these, these structural changes where the individual isn't considered as much um, quite yet. Uh, but I'm not specific to adaptation. I'm not quite sure yet why the psychological perspective or the individual perspective has been overlooked. Uh, I mean, there is work more on, on how communities adapt to climate change. And I think also more sociologists and anthropologists are working more on that community perspective. So that has been uh, relatively well represented in the literature. Uh, but I think there's just also been a lack of uh, psychologists also contributing to this field uh, and, and, and sharing our perspective on it, which may be also be one of the reasons why this has been a little bit overlooked. Uh, but there has been change also since we published also that literature review that I showed, uh, we see that there's more interest in it. And there's also been many papers published since that time. Uh, so we do see that there's a bit of a shift happening um, there. Uh, and your second question is also about the typology of adaptation behaviors. Um, and indeed, we, we this is another element maybe why it's difficult for policymakers to consider adaptation behavior also uh, at the individual level in, in the policies or the, the, the communication strategies they want to include, because it can be difficult to tell what in your specific region the, the, the behaviors are that even can be considered adaptive. Uh, and this is also a problem that we run into when we want to conduct research on adaptation behaviors, uh, because for mitigation behaviors, it's often clear and it's, it's usually the same across regions, uh, what you can do to reduce your carbon footprint, right? Uh, whereas for adaptation behaviors, it, it completely depends on what kind of climate related risks you are facing. So is it is it droughts? Is it flooding? Is it heat waves? Uh, is it severe storms? And all of these will have different kinds of adaptation behaviors that might uh, also be more or less effective depending on the, on the context that you're in. Also the cultural context here can play a huge role and how feasible or effective these behaviors are. So it does seem that adaptation is, is quite context specific uh, at that level. And that does make it difficult to also clearly outline this is what we mean when we talk about adaptation behaviors. Maybe I'll ask a question and then we can go back to you, uh, Alessia. Okay. We, we, we can go back and forth. So yeah. when you, at, at the end, when you talked about uh, these um, perceptions, I, I, I really found, I, I never heard about this talk agnostic adaptation or avoid talking about climate change when you present adaptation policies and the extreme of that i guess is the inflation reduction act right in the us where a lot of climate policy has been put under the label of inflation so yes. um, that's a very interesting one i don't know if you if you thought about what that means for policymakers even going forward should we do that also in europe i mean I don't know how far do you go in, in policy recommendations in your work? Uh... In general, um, I would say to specific to the agnostic adaptation theme. Uh, so we recently published a paper, um, which is a little bit on a different topic, but it's related to uh, this discussion as well, because we, we conducted a literature review on the psychological distance of climate change. And basically the psychological distance of climate change is this idea that I also briefly mentioned in the presentation, that people may see climate change as, as 
as happening, but it's affecting other people in other countries very far away. And also it's going to happen very far away in time. So pe the people would see it um, as something that's not going to happen in, in the next few years. It's something that's going to happen 50 years from now. And this is a, an explanation that's quite popular within our literature and also beyond that for explaining why people may be less motivated to act on climate change. Uh, but what we did is we looked at all the public opinion polls uh, where people were asked questions about when they think climate change is going to happen and where. And we actually found uh, that most people don't think climate change is psychologically distant. So most people are actually aware that climate change is happening now, that it's also going to have local impact. And also there are a surprising amount of people say, yes, I'm going to be personally affected by climate change. Uh, and in general, if you look at these, at these um, public opinion polls on climate change, a majority of people, very consistently, a very large majority, accepts the reality of climate change, that it's caused by humans, and also that it has negative consequences. So overall, I would actually say that it's not a good idea to separate adaptation from climate change, uh, because I feel like it's not necessary to kind of avoid the climate war, since we know from, from uh, these, these public opinion polls that the very large majority of people does accept the reality of climate change, does see that it is already happening now and also thinks they will be personally uh, affected. Um, so given that knowledge, it makes sense to me that also we keep adaptation connected to the theme of climate change because people know this, they are aware of this. They're so I feel like there should be no reason to hide this. Maybe in, in communities where there's a lot of climate skepticism, it makes sense. But across the board, I would say um, most people want to hear this and can hear this message of how climate change and adaptation go together. Okay, thank you. Alessia? Yeah, yes. Uh, so I agree uh, with your comment and I want to uh, say thanks for uh, your clarification. And actually, I have uh, <laughs> some comments also related to the second part, because I, I really found that this part really, really interesting. And so especially the, the, when you explain the, the factor uh, that motivate people to adapt uh, to climate change. So for instance, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, some adaptation behaviors uh, such as uh, evacuation, uh, migration uh, or protection against a natural disaster, maybe uh, an effective, I was thinking, I don't know if it's, if it's correct, but uh, maybe an effective strategy could be, uh, for instance, increasing ev uh, evacuation uh, simulation in, in the areas uh, that are more affected by natural disaster. And maybe in this way, uh, the people's confidence and consequently also their uh, self-efficiency may increase uh, and also the probability that they upset uh, climate adaptive behavior. And then I was thinking about uh, responsibility. So I, I believe that uh, this concept is strictly linked with the information and the individual's knowledge. Mm, so in, in fact, I think that uh, so very often we can hear that uh, um, we need the more information campaign in order to increase people awareness and also the responsibility, but uh, Actually, to the best of my knowledge, it's also true that uh, according to behavioral economics, uh, information campaigns, campaign are not enough for changing behavior. And my question in, is, uh, so do you think that uh, in this case, so giving more information with, uh, for instance, uh, information campaign can help people uh, to increase their responsibility and consequently promoting uh, these uh, adoption uh, behaviors? Thank you. Yes, uh, indeed, responsibility. So a sense of feeling personally responsible for taking adaptation measures was also one of the factors that came out uh, of, of our literature review as one of the more stronger predictors of adaptation behavior. So this sense of responsibility does seem to play indeed an important role uh, and that definitely shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, but how to communicate or how do we share this responsibility, I think is indeed quite a challenge. And I don't think I've seen really interventions quite yet or, or communication campaigns right yet uh, that, that 
focus on this specific element of how do we um, how do we bring people on board and also accepting this responsibility because of course if you do an information campaign say as a government uh, saying okay you are responsible for, for implementing these measures uh, then you can do this but people also need to accept this responsibility and agree with it and then subsequently act on it so i would agree with your point that maybe just information campaigns uh, are not sufficient for people to also get to this point of accepting this responsibility but how do we do do we get there that i think is kind of a difficult question uh, that hasn't been studied that well yet, or maybe I don't, I'm not aware of the literature that has looked at this, but I can and can imagine that maybe a more, uh, it will take a longer time also, and it might, uh, we might need to seek the dialogue also between uh, governments and, and their constituents and uh, also delineating where does responsibility lie? Because I think often maybe uh, municipalities may assume, okay, this is the responsibility of the citizens and the citizens may assume this is something the government does, uh, but then there might be also this kind of unawareness or uh, or un unclarities about wh whose responsibilities lie where. So I think that there should be more of a dialogue also ongoing there. Um, uh, and and how to foster that dialogue, that's indeed also a very good question. Um, also because, of course, governments have different levels from the national to the local. So I can imagine at the local level this would look different. Uh, but for example, the Netherlands, uh, the especially the flood uh, flooding uh, measures have always been very centralized at uh, the government level and always been uh, taken care of. Uh, there, so I feel like a lot of Dutch people will not directly perceive this personal responsibility that, that they need to prepare for flooding because they will always assume, okay, this is something that the government regulates, we have dikes, these kinds of structures, so then, you know, that this, they might assume this is why we don't need to personally take any action, but now, two years ago, we had a big flood also in the Netherlands, and then uh, now people are starting to realize more, okay, uh, the climate might be changing, we might be getting more of these events. And and again, there, we're also getting to a point where maybe governments become overstretched in their capacity to uh, offer this protection to their citizens. So also clearly communicating that indeed should be the first step. Uh, and then, yes, we we'll, we'll have to work together to make sure that this responsibility and is somehow transferred, but also accepted by the citizens. And maybe it depends on, on the level of citizen trust for government i think no yes yes that's absolutely important i think it's quite important so uh, i agree with you that uh, uh, information campaign is not enough uh, especially if citizen mm, don't trust on government uh, i think it's uh, a, a big challenge okay thanks many thanks um if it's okay for you, Alessia, unless I, I will take some questions from the Q&A box. Yeah, sure. Um, so I can read out um, the first one. I think, well, I will combine the first two. Um, so Miriam is uh, asking, since adaptation doesn't happen overnight, do we maybe um, need to have a timeline? Do you think that this also connects with climate education, introducing it into schools? Um, with, through adaptation studies and then maybe connected to that the first question of the same Miriam is um, if we would do that what tips would you give concrete to people that want to take action uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I agree that indeed adaptation doesn't happen overnight. Um, and we've seen the same also maybe a bit more with these mitigation or for environmental behaviors that before maybe people weren't that aware uh, about, you know, the things that they could do in their day to day life uh, to reduce, say, their carbon emissions. But now we see that the, the general awareness of what kind of actions you can take has really changed uh, um, 
over time but again this this took quite of a, a long time for this the public awareness to be there uh, because already 10 years ago say uh, people were not that aware of the impact of eating meat on the environment now we hear about this often it's in the news often many people know about this so these things indeed do take time but they can change um, and i think uh, now that we've already have good momentum in um, educating people or pe or this public creating this public awareness about climate change mitigation and what people can do, I think that we could maybe use this momentum to also make people aware more about adaptation. And this is also one of the another reason why I think this agnostic adaptation is maybe not such a good idea because we already have this momentum and this collective awareness about climate change and people are already changing their behaviors to become more pro environmental. So it makes sense to me that we use that energy and that momentum to also uh, connect that to the, the adaptation challenge that is there as well. I was pushing next to the button on to <laughs> unmute myself. Um, no, then we have uh, Julie who uh, compliments you for your presentation. Also in the chat, we had several people giving you compliments. Some people even asking if they can get a copy of your presentation. Yeah, I saw <laughs> the, the question and I will absolutely, I can send it to you, uh, Anna, no worries. <laughs> And if you like us to do, we can even put a PDF uh, version on our website of the event together with the recording. Oh, um, that would be great. Yeah. So let's also come to the question of Julie. So um, she says that, um, yeah, she asks if, if there is a link with disaster risk communication to local communities and especially vulnerable people, right? How to strengthen for that specific group um, adaptive behavior and then in general is supporting you in saying that psychologists neuroscientists and scientists should work more together um, and maybe also there you can say a few words on on if you think that is now going in the right direction or more work is needed great yeah thanks a lot uh, for this interesting question indeed i think uh, disaster um Risk communication and, and adaptation are very closely related. And uh, there, there's also some literature on this, really trying to find uh, overlaps and also making sure we're not reinventing the wheel entirely because there is a large literature on disaster risk reduction as well. Um, so there's, and also for, for example, for our literature review, uh, most of the studies that we included were also conducted in, in the mindset or from the perspective of disaster risk reduction rather than specifically climate change adaptation uh, so I've done an, uh, um, I don't want to say they are exactly the same because I have read some papers that do say that there are some nuance between them and we should consider them as two separate things um, but um, I do think there, there's a lot we can learn from this, this disaster risk reduction literature, uh, and especially also in how do we connect also more to these, indeed, these vulnerable populations, because that's indeed, uh, I think, a challenge that also goes beyond, a little bit beyond psychology, because often vulnerable populations, it also uh, intersects with other issues, such as, for example, more uh, economic or sociological uh, developments in that specific area which is the reason why people are vulnerable uh, and we know in general that uh, for example uh, particular groups such as women or the elderly or uh, otherwise disadvantaged groups are also usually more exposed to climate change risk so there's definitely an intersection there uh, between um, uh, the disadvantaged groups in general and also the, the, that they bear more of the impacts of climate change. Uh, and there are also opportunities there, I think, to address maybe multiple of these issues at the same time. Uh, but here also, uh, kind of nicely leading into the next question, I think that we should very uh, much also consider this in collaboration with other disciplines because issues like uh, 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 systemic inequalities or, or, or environmental racism are kind of outside of the, the purview of environmental psychology. We are aware of them, but we do not directly study them. So we I do really think that this is important, but I would I don't want to say too much about it because I feel like this is more also in the purview of scholars who are maybe more in the humanities. As far as, for example, human geographers who are doing great work on this, also sociologists and anthropologists. I think they really also have that perspective more on how uh, inequalities and climate impacts uh, intersect. So 
expressly I forward your call for more collaborations and uh, not only with maybe more the the um, uh, more uh, natural sciences, but also the the, the other social sciences that uh, are doing uh, excellent work on these topics as well. Thank you, Anna. Meanwhile, you got congrats from Tanzania, East Africa, <laughs> as well. Uh, That's maybe great. The, Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> the last question we could pick up, maybe, um, uh, is the one on this just transition in the context of the EU Green Deal. Anna is asking about that, whether you already connect with that or or, or not. Yes, uh, this is a, another great question. Uh, and it, it kind of relates to what I was also just saying a little bit, I think, about how uh, I think justice and climate impacts are very closely related. And we're seeing that uh, more and more. Um, also, I know from some of the research my colleagues are doing that uh, if we talk about climate policies uh, and whether people find them acceptable or not, one of the key uh, uh, variables here is also the perceived fairness of these policies. Um, so it does seem that also not only in an academic sense, but also lay people really recognize that this, this fairness issue uh, is really critical to um, the whole climate transition as well. Um, but again, it's, it's a topic that I think there's a lo lot of literature on it. I'm not necessarily an expert on, so I again, I, I have to defer a little bit to my colleagues here who might be uh, a little bit more uh, well-versed in this literature also on, on justice. Uh, but we are, of course, considering it, considering it also from a psychological perspective, uh, but yes, more collaborations are definitely important here so that also that the research that we are conducting as psychologists indeed is also, um, uh, aware and of these issues, and that we're also taking them into consideration uh, when we are giving our policy recommendations. Thank you, Anna. We're out of questions. So, Alessia, I'm looking at you. If you still want to make a final comment or very short question, I don't know if you want to say something on this capable project a bit more on what we will do. Uh, yes, sure. Thanks. So thanks for the opportunity. So, uh, so I, 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 I'd like to introduce uh, very briefly the Capable Project. Uh, so the aim of this project is uh, to develop uh, methodological and empirical advances in uh, climate policy evaluation by in integrating both economic, economic and social aspect. And uh, it will also provide recommendation in order to design socially and economic economically acceptable climate policy measure. And so in this project uh, are involved uh, several uh, European partners uh, and uh, the FSR climate team will work uh, on different topics. Uh, for instance, uh, we've, we will focus on uh, assessing uh, the effectiveness of uh, European ETS or the role of a scientific advisory board in climate policies, the possible obstacles uh, to the ecological transition at regional and at local level, and also uh, the issue of uh, citizen engagement in climate action. And I think uh, it's a really, really interesting project because uh, we need to consider both economic and social aspect, but also we need to consider both policymaker and citizen perspective. And I really believe that uh, we will obtain a, a very interesting and useful result in, uh, in the future. So. Hopefully, next meta study <laughs> Anna does, we will have some research to be included in that meta study. Yeah. And if I understood, Groningen is also part of the project, right? So uh, we might uh, yes. still be in touch, uh, Anna. <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. And, uh, well, Great. That's it. I, again, Anna, really thank you for your work. Really interesting. Nice presentation. Great questions, Alessia. Thanks to the mm -hmm. audience as well. And uh, yeah, you will have the link, you will have the recording, and you will have Anna's presentation on the website. Uh, that's it. All Thank have a great day.